Welcome to Politics in Prince George's. We have a great show lined up for you. We're going to cover some of the most important issues facing the county and the nation. We begin with our Power Pack panel. Joining me today are journalist Shannon Cross of TV One and Dr. Dennis Rogers, Assistant Dean of Government at Bowie State University. Thanks for joining me, guys. Assistant Pleasure. Assistant Professor, not Dean. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> Assistant <laughs> Professor. Okay. Yes. Uh, but let's get started with our conversation, particularly let's talk about the minimum wage increase here in Prince George's County and that we're going to see across the state. Uh, Shannon, I want to start with you. Okay. How important is this going to be for low-wage workers? Uh, it's very important. Uh, I think it's a great first step, but it's just the beginning. I mean, the fact that they're only going to increase it to about a little over $11 by 2017, that's three years from now. We should already be at $11 or more. Uh, my home state of Washington is looking to move it to about $15, and I agree that that's where we should be. It should be well above $22,000 annually uh, that these folks are bringing in. That's an important conversation. The area of SeaTac, Seattle, Tacoma that you mentioned, talked exactly. about having a $15 minimum wage. Dr. Rogers, let me turn to you. Some, some people talk about the fact that this is being phased in, is what Ms. Cross just referenced. Is that going to ultimately be problematic where in 2016, 2017, we'll be revisiting a call to raise the minimum wage once again. The thing about the economics of Prince George's County for my analysis is that there's a segment of the population that are doing well. As you know, we're one of the wealthiest African American county, the wealthiest African American county in the nation. Uh, in addition, there are some of our citizens who need um, to have the boat lifted, if you will. And as I see it, the minimum wage phase in is certainly a part of the process, but unless and until we address this idea of expanding the opportunities for those who are paid at the minimum wage at this point, we're going to find ourselves revisiting this situation with basically the same numbers in the same categories. In other words, we must continue to increase the opportunities for those that are in that segment of the population, but also educate them so that they can work their way out of being in minimum wage six years from now, seven years from now, when we re revisit this issue. Some people, Dr. Rogers, I'm going to push back with that. Some people okay. often say if you just raise the minimum wage, then we find the price of goods and services will then go up, nullifying any gains made in the raise in minimum wage. How do you respond to that? Well, the cost of living is inevitable. It will, in fact, rise because you know, goods and services rise, companies need to generate a profit every quarter, continues to be consistent, and they continue to seek ways in which to expand their profit, including raising prices. So in essence, what I see is that we must ensure that those citizens who are earning minimum wage today are also being workforce developed so that they can work and earn their way into being out of the minimum wage. Shannon, your thoughts on businesses? Well, uh, just to your point here, uh, with these folks who are at below poverty level, let's make sure that that's clear. If the median salary here in Prince George's is about 77000 if you're only bringing in 20000 or 22000 a year, you're just maintaining poverty level. So unless we're moving that, again, with education and, and programs to make sure that they're achieving at a higher level and, and able to then take on another job at another level other than, uh, say, you know, working at McDonald's. I know we always give that example, but mm -hmm. uh, it, what can we do to get them to that next level? I think that's what we need to address. Dr. Rogers, that's an important question. What can we do to get workers to that next level? When we look at our education, here in Prince George's County. We see at the high school level, we see at the Prince George's Community College level, at the University of Bowie State and the University of Maryland level, an extreme example of opportunities that exist in the brain trust to put these minds to work to ensure that the students are being prepared for 21st century jobs. And until we're doing that at the high school level and in encouraging students to go to either a community college or four-year institution or the military in return to continue their education at a community college or four-year institution, we're going to find ourselves chasing this ball again. Dr. Rogers, some models, some who criticize the economic model of capitalism offer that there will always be losers, there will always be a lower class, there will always be low-wage workers. That's kind of how the winners have to exist. Is there an opportunity where all of us can thrive in this model? <laughs> Globally, as a nation, as a state, as a county, with this model of economics, there is, there will be, there have been haves and have nots. I think what's imperative for us to consider is that capitalism in America is going nowhere. 
right? Let's be frank. It hasn't, it will not, it can be modified. It can have a, a more uh, friendlier face, if you will. But ultimately, if our objective is to increase property values here in Prince George's County, opportunities in Prince George's County, and a workforce that can seize opportunities both in Prince George's County and internationally, we must use education as a vehicle to do so. And the need for both the university education, government, and businesses to partner is imperative for us to do that. Not surprising that the professor would be the one espousing education exactly. as a way to, to grow us out of the space. <laughs> Shannon, I want to revisit real quickly the idea of this capitalism being the way of the world. Sure. Uh, we understand that, as Dr. Rogers alluded to, capitalism is going nowhere, right. but we do live in many ways a mixed market society. Mm -hmm. We see programs such as Medicare uh, that's very socialist, and we hear of the socialist Obamacare, though the merits of calling it that are flawed, we understand. Right. But talk about this idea of what kind of partnerships we think that a, a government and private industry can make to help kind of nurse this uh, lower class for Prince George's County residents and residents of the nation. I mean, again, it starts with the schools and, and at home. You've got to have, I mean, you brought your son here today, a three, your three-year-old son. I mean, he's learning on the spot, right. you know? And I mean, that, it's great that kids can now be a part of the everyday things that we're a part of and we are, um, we, we have these resources to now literally be a sponge for information. So it's about getting that getting that type of exposure, and then now you have an opportunity to excel beyond just, okay, I wanna be a basketball player or a singer or a dancer, nothing wrong with those things, but when you expose these kids to other industries, especially tech, they're gonna be interested in, Dr. in that. Dr. Rogers gives another thought on it. I was just gonna add, the NFL commissioner was on 60 Minutes, and he said mm -hmm. something interesting. He said, when you look at the NFL as an industry, they do have a mixed market utilization. So the NFL uh, markets are divided up by cities, Dallas being the number one market, Washington metropolitan area being the number two market, but in addition, all teams share in a profit sharing generalized right. way yeah, from the television sharing, revenue. Yeah, they have uh, where they all put into the pot, particularly from television revenue. Exactly. The interesting thing, not long ago, the Green Bay Packers were the Super Bowl champion. Green Bay is collectively owned by the the, the team is collectively owned by the city of Green Bay. Yes. Socialism at its best, winning the championship <laughs> of the Socialist Football and, League. And so, what I would just add is what this means for uh, the the future of Prince George's County, in my opinion, is that. If we begin to, say, invest in the tech sector and invest in the education of those who want to incubate businesses, who want to start startups in the tech sector, even though it's a highly educated class, engineers that are, for the most part, technicians, mm -hmm. you expand the economy from within so that you can absorb others yeah, into absolutely. it. Absolutely, and hopefully not have to revisit a minimum wage conversation in a mere four years. Exactly. Let me advance this conversation, though, <laughs> and I want to change the topic and talk a little bit about marijuana. Now, we all can make jokes about it, the Mary Jane, whatever, whatever, <laughs> but we've seen recently there have been legislation that has moved through the state house about medicinal marijuana, and there's a large-scale push across the nation as well to not, not necessarily legalize marijuana, although it has been in some places, but decriminalize it. First, I want to get your individual opinions, uh, perhaps your college days aside, about <laughs> your feelings on the legalization or decriminalization of marijuana. Shannon, get us started, please. Well, it's interesting you bring this up. Uh, I actually was talking to a young lady about it last night, and she admitted that she actually smokes marijuana, and she was excited about it. Now, uh, recreationally or for recreationally? Recreationally. Okay. Uh, and she said that. Basically, you know, them decriminalizing this here in D.C. Is, is great. I mean, they can now focus on bigger criminals. Uh, they're not locking away these folks who have a dime bag, if you, you know, if you want to say that. But it, it's now let's focus on the big guys and, and let these other guys just pay this fine of, what is it, $100? That's in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. kind of make its way to Prince George's County in the same way. But we're seeing yeah. the trends move in that direction. Dr. Rogers? So we understand prohibition is a part of the nation's history. And at one point, it was you know, illegal to distribute or to purchase alcoholic beverages. And there was such a push from the users and the marketers, the sellers, that the government had to change its mind. So I'm wondering if that's what we're seeing in the marketplace. And it's interesting you mentioned that because violence was also tied to that, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with alcohol, the St. Valentine's Day massacre, we remember. Yes. But even on the question of marijuana, uh, is it there? Is it a morality piece that folks are unhappy about, or is it some type of health ramification? Shannon, what are you hearing more? There's a responsibility factor um, because some folks will say, "Oh, well, if you're if you're doing drugs, it is still considered a drug, even though people use it so widely." Uh, that you're, you know, not going to be going to work on time. You're not going to be going to school on time. You're going to have no worries, as they say. And so, folks want you to be, as folks, I mean, parents right. want you to be responsible. And so, if they have a child that's in college and they know that they're smoking weed. Uh, 
I don't there's know. A, there, there's a health issue as well, okay. yeah. right? So you have people who are subject to paranoia, uh -huh. uh, health in terms of the neglect of eating balanced meals, taking care of their responsibilities, as we indicated. Mm -hmm. And I have yet to see a medical study that talks about the long-term medicinal impact of marijuana. And also We've seen a lot a of these drug. on tobacco, I, we have, but in terms of but marijuana, I tell you what's interesting. I like that you're in a reference of responsibility because there's a collective responsibility that comes with us being citizens that are shared space. President Obama touched right. on that when he talks about our having our being our brother's keeper. Yes. That's an initiative that he put forward to particularly aim at men and color, men and boys of color. And Dr. Rogers, you being the father of one and having once <laughs> been a boy of color, <laughs> tell us your thoughts on President Obama's well, initiative. I, I thought it was interesting that it came up in his second uh, his second session, if you will. Second term, yeah. Thank very, you, second term. So. And it Is made it me... because perhaps there's no more elections to run for after that? that so. That's possibly <laughs> it. Okay. it. It made me reflect on the Million Man March because oh, okay. from my perspective, it comes on the heels or on the, you know, on the cusp of us celebrating the 20-year anniversary of the Million Man March. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, there was a lot of movement around this idea of us being collectively responsible for what's yeah, occurring in our called, community. At the time, it was called Promise Keepers. Shannon? Yes. Well, Promise Were Keepers you, was a slightly the, different, but, but there was the Million Man March, then there was Promise Keepers, and now, yes. True. Shannon. My brother's and, keeper. And, again, the initiative it started in Chicago, right? And so this is just a bigger initiative now, and I love that he's bringing these young people to the White House. And just the look at the starry look in their eyes was just, it really made me all warm and fuzzy inside. So I love that he's doing this. Some people say it's a little too late, and he's just trying to check that box of, hey, I oh. did something for the African Americans, so I can say you that know, I've hold, done that Hold now. that thought, because that's definitely something that yeah. some folks may disagree with. We're going to come back to that. Don't go away. The President's Report Card is up next. Thank you.